Let's try again. Hi folks, second time lucky. Um, still dropping frames. Oh, I don't know what's causing that. Um, we just have to go with it for now. If it gets too bad, then we'll um, then we deal with that. Now, um, mum, 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 where are we? Uh, let me try and open a file whilst I can. This will be useful in a second. What I want to talk about today, uh, unfortunately, there's not going to be any um, uh, software work today. Um, it's not really going to be any hardware work per se. We're not going to work on the CAD, although uh, I will try and open it in KeyCAD. Uh, where we are and just have a play around with it because I've got a few things to discuss a couple of things have changed that I've got to get resolved Let me see if I can open the latest version. It's an Eagle file that I'm opening in KeyCap by the way um, Where is it I should have just copied over here we go Um, just importing it there with me folks and then I'll talk about what we're going to do oh, I did have a folder for this keycad imports here we go Hopefully this will let, enable me to um, import the stuff. Cool. So I've imported the um, a, a, a version of the Eagle file that I was working on before. Let me know if my audio levels are uh, good by the way. Now, uh, let me share the screen. So I do have a keycap thing in here, I think. Let's try that. Mm -hmm. No, not Discord. So this is a little bit confusing. This is for illustration purposes rather than the final CAD, but um, you can see I've been messing with things a lot. Let me get rid of some of the routing here because it's, um, uh, how do we do this? The unrooted layer on here. Not that one. Hmm. Well, this is fun. Um, Assembly view. Um, hmm. 
hold on selection oh this is fun slightly harder than it needs to be. Well, let me just set some preferences here as well. I hate this zoom like this. Uh, display options. Do 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 do. Um, hmm. Accelerated graphics dots. So what I'm going to talk about um, today, or what I'd like to talk about, is um, uh, Laurie says hi, audio fine. Western Long says hey, audio fine. Um, thank you guys. Laurie also says uh, missed a few minutes. Don't worry too much, Laurie, because I had a full start. I was waiting for an important call because my uh, mum's in hospital again. Uh, she's been in there on and off for the last few weeks, but um, she had her scan results today, which are good. They're all clear, which is good news. Um, the What I want to do today is talk about the uh, IceLogic um, bench or bus or whatever you want to call it and the options. I've, I've made some changes here. I'm just... Let me just change, I'm just trying to change the, um, uh, the zooming because it's got a really annoying uh, mouse touchpad. Center warps cursor on zoom, yeah, get rid of that. That's the thing. God, that does my head in that thing. That's what we want. So um, now I need to work out how to turn off the uh, show board rat's nest. Yay! <laughs> See, I will learn KeyCAD eventually. Um, I've made some changes. Uh, the routing on this is taking ages, by the way. It's a Bit of a nightmare because I'm trying to cram a lot more connectivity into a lot smaller space. Um, that obviously uh, isn't particularly um, helpful. Um, let me just get rid of that for a sec. The um, Right, there's several layers to this. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do here, let me just explain some of the things I'm trying to do. Can you see all these resistor arrays? Uh, those weren't all there before. I'm seeing if I can route everything through these resistor arrays in order to reduce ringing on the interconnectivity. So anything that goes out to a connector goes out via these kind of 22R resistors, which should provide a better impedance match for the connectivity but it's tricky because there's not much room here as you can see um, so that's caused me endless hours of routing fun and rerouting more importantly um, also the density here on the microcontroller is a lot higher now because I've got ST RAM here which I have to connect in as well as um, all the other things that I need to connect to uh, if I turn it back on, you'll see what I mean. Uh, where's it gone? I've lost my rat's nest now. I changed my menu. Um, you can see the kind of star effect 
on the route out of the pins that are going out to connectors. You can see them all going out to the matching resistors to match the impedance. Um, but on here around the ST, um, right. I'm also going to need the remarkable tab up in order to um, remind you guys of where we were and the changes because this is quite an important part. Let me just get the right page. Uh, it's this one, I think. Uh, which one shall I do first? Uh, whilst that remarkable desktop's coming up. That works surprisingly well over wine, I'm very impressed. So, um, let's just do the CAD stuff first. So, what have I done? What have I changed? Um, the mezzanine, so if you look at the lines here between this point and this point, that was about 12 mil. That's now been expanded to about 13 and a half, 14 mil. I can't remember the exact size off the top of my head. And the reason that I've done that is to increase the connectors on here. These two pairs of connectors were 20 pins each. I've now changed those to 24 pins each, which by the way were the same as the old mezzanine uh, density, 24 pins each, because I need to get more signals up. So why have I done that? Why have I changed this? Okay, so the primary motivation here um, is the thing that was really bugging me about where the design was as of, what was it, last week? Oh, and I apologise for um, the Friday stream, by the way. Um, I just couldn't get a decent um, uh, stream out, probably because of the storm, Eunice or whatever. It's probably disrupting the um, uh, my internet providers' networks. So I gave up. I tried a couple of times, but it was just it was it was pointless. It was just dropping more frames and it was sending. Um, so the reason I've increased the width or height, if you like, of this mezzanine here is to enable more connections in here. Now, why I've done that is because what was bugging me before, remember before I talked about there being a design for this top half, if you like, which included the mezzanine, which had the memory on it for the retro stroke learning deck. Uh, it had the learning feature type things such as the seven segments, VGA, etc. Now that was mapped into one board, both the mezzanine and that. Um, the pins were shared between the two. Well, I reanalyzed the situation and decided I could change things. I'd also um, slightly miscounted the pins and realized that it was possible to actually do uh, the to actually separate out the memory, which is what I ideally want to do. So in other words, if this mezzanine can just hold the memory, in this case I'm talking about this memory chip here, uh, which is the PS RAM and flash all in one. If I've got enough pins on here on this mezzanine just to do that, I should do that. That was the aim. And when I started redo it, going through the pins, I found that that is actually possible by reorganizing things. Why would I want to do that? Because that means if the mezzanine and the memory is separate, that leaves me free to do whatever I like or whatever anyone likes with the ICE logic board because the tiles are no longer tied into a mezzanine. So that gives us maximum freedom, uh, which I thought was a very desirable thing. It was bugging me that if, we, if you got the, uh, the, the retro top board bit, that including the memory and the mezzanine and the top tile functionalities, if you didn't want to use that anymore and you took that off, you were also taking away your memory. 
And you may be quite happy using that memory. You might not want to be replacing it with, say, the Hyper RAM flash solution. It just seemed a poor decision if it could be avoided. And on re-examining it and juggling a few things around, I think I can do it. What's more, I think I can do it and include the memory masking as well, because I know how important that is to some, to some folks. So there's now enough pins. So what I've got now is I've got 48 pins on the uh, mezzanine board, which is enough to do the full memory requirement. Because the full memory requirement is you need 38 pins uh, for your PS RAM and flash data and address. You need two pins for your chip selects, so we're up to 40. Then you need um, the upper and lower uh, byte masking controls, and you need the output enable and write enable. So we're up to 44. Um, but you also, of course, need power, among other things. Um, there is one more that you might need um, between the microcontroller and the decoder. Um, so if we go switch back just temporarily, hold on. Uh, remember on this diagram here, what we had going on was we could, as well as reading the chip select lines from the STM32 to know when it's selected, we also have a control over the decoder that selected the um, the chipset. Hold on, let me reduce myself here. I'm in the way. So the decoder that's providing the chip selects for the flash and the PS RAM here is controlled by this decoder. Uh, sorry, let me do it on the diagram here. Well, in fact, what I can do is I can point to it using this. So um, on here. This decoder controls the chip selects for the PS RAM and flash, etc. So the STM has to monitor those chip select lines, but it also has this enable pin, so it can disable all of the chip select lines with the flash and PS RAM. Now in this diagram, we needed to do that because we were reusing the SPI lines. Again, I'm going to reuse the SPI lines in this example. So those lines go up as part of the memory interface. In this case, the SPI lines are being used as the chip, chip, chip select lines and the uh, A0 and A1. So there is sharing. That also means that I can take control of the chip select lines here if I need to in the STM32 when I'm programming the ICE40 using the SPI lines. So I can safely reprogram the, the ICE40 in the same way that we did before. Um, we probably haven't shown on here, but we've also got these um, other two lines now. Um, which are the upper and lower bytes. So I'll just add these here. LB and UB. Um, in fact, it's a bit deceptive because we're actually using the SP lines for those two, if I remember rightly. No, those are separate. So basically, we've now got our full complement. Um, and because of that, our tiles are now separate. So what we don't need anymore is this stuff. All this specific stuff we don't need. Um, 
because we do it via tiles. Now there may be a case for doing combined tiles. But what I'm thinking here is keeping maximum flexibility. Well, it leaves lots of dots when you do this erasing. Is that meant to be realistic? <laughs> Not sure I like that. Yeah, what's this? Don't need those. Why do we have CX on there? So these are back to being pure tiles. But the advantage of this situation is let me just put it down for a sec that we have complete free reign so whatever we provide say as a black ice xx solution which i'll come back to in a minute um, it could be done just using a selection of tiles it doesn't require anything specific And it will obviously include some sort of mezzanine, probably um, as before. By default, it will include the PS RAM uh, flash mezzanine or the traditional um, address data bus. So, um, That's the important change. So we've come a little bit full circle, if you like, but with the maximum flexibility. Um, was there anything else on this diagram that's changed? I think everything else is the same. I'm just looking at it right now. No, I think that's I think that's all good. So um, as far as the these bits go for the SPI, so when they're not being used as SPI, as I say, these can be used for the chip select pins, which that's not drawn very well now. These should be a continuation of those, maybe. Hold on. It's confusing. We just redraw this slightly. Let's see if I can make this a bit clearer. Um, so included in the SPI pins then, as well as the ch two chip selects, the other two pins act as the base address uh, A0 and A1. Uh, the reason for that is that gives us four internal addresses in the STM32, uh, which is useful. Um, okay, yes, yeah, that one done. So going back to any questions on that before I get rid of the diagram here, by the way, I'm just about to switch back to the PCB. Cool. I mean, I can turn this back on if we need to. We can come back to this. So, on the keycap front, um, apart from all the crappy routing I have to do, um, th there's a few knock-on effects um, 
Don't let me forget to come back to what we can do on the hyperram mezzanine, hyperram hyperflash mezzanine, because there's some changes that we've now enabled on that because of the changes I've just made. But let's let's just stick with uh, what we were thinking of as the um, retro retro configuration because um, I need to cover the points on that first. Now. Um, you'll also see on this diagram, I am kind of playing around with, uh, this isn't the uh, actual CAD version I'm working on to do the routing, as you may tell, because it's got a whole bunch of other stuff on here. It doesn't belong. Because I'm trying to imagine what it looks like when it's populated with tiles. Um, the one that we were familiar with, the obvious one is the seven segment one, which you see at the top here. So that's basically, if you can imagine, you know, the seven seg tile facing inward, um, clamping onto the logic board itself, such that, um, I think we've been through this before, but I will show you again. I did have another one somewhere, it's gone. Damn it, I lost it. So that means that we have this kind of effect on this tile, like that, so it comes through. But obviously that's level with the top because the aperture here that it's fitting into is larger on the newer version. So it kind of pokes through. And also the tile connectors, which are on this side on this PCB, on the back side on the new one so um, just in terms of deciding what goes where let me just put this on um, one of the things I was going through again in terms of combinations was this is where I get a bit indecisive so if we were to imagine a black ice configuration okay that's kind of what I'm thinking of here what does the black ice configuration of the ice logic board look like now the seven segment one I think is a good one to have we'll come back to that in a sec secondly the other thing I was thinking is what you need is you need display you need some sort of keyboard connectivity and potentially audio. I say potentially audio because there's a couple of ways of skinning that. So one of the things that I was playing around with is the, a, a tile that looks something like this here. Now in this tile, I mean, one of the things I had an issue with is trying to use the um, host, uh, USB host, tile oh, come on. right I've got to try and remember my keycap commands does it move yeah so these things are proper massive they are as Esden would refer to them chonkers and they're just too big the only place you can put them is in these apertures but once they're in these apertures, they're too big to be easily used. Um, and if you want them like this, you really need a pair of them as well, because you need two channels. Whether, that, whether you're using a USB over PS2, uh, PS2 over USB, or if you're using it as USB. Um, so these don't make a good solution so one of the things i've been thinking about can i um yeah i can tell you that one of my considerations then excuse me a sec is to consider using usb-c at the end of the day however this works got to go to some sort of keyboard right whether that's a regular USB keyboard in which case you can use a regular adapter 
or even if it's a PS2 adapter, you need the D plus and the D minus minimum, right? USB-C to USB-A uh, female host adapters are common as uh, muck, to use the uh, northern term. So if you use a USB-C, it's easy to adapt it to a USB-A if you have the confines of a USB-A only type keyboard solution. In other words, if your keyboard has a built-in you know, lead with a USB-A mail on the end of it, um, that's easily catered for. Now, the other thing that we can do with USB-C that we can't do with uh, the USB host A's is we have the other pins. So we, as well as putting um, FPGA pins on the USB DPD plus, we can also use the S bus pins and add another two pins. So effectively we can have four pins in one connector. That can then easily break out to those keyboards um, that I was pointing to in the last few weeks. And I've looked at more of those, by the way, as well. I've also found some good Rust libraries, which is interesting. Um, the, those keyboards use a mixture of I2C or UART or USB. So given that we've got FPGA pins, it's easy to switch them into whatever mode we need. And it would be a relatively simple USB adapter cable. So our USB-C adapter cable would break uh, out into a number of different uh, um, connectors, depending on what keyboard you're connected to. So that could be a little breakout board, which I can make, it's easy enough. Um, that board is capable of doing things like USB to PS2 translation, if you haven't got a keyboard that will do that. Um, however, I think if we're controlling the firmware on any of those keyboards, we can have it do the PS2 stuff relatively simply. Um, he said, again, I was looking into that this week, and actually it's not quite as trivial as it sounds. Most of the newer keyboard firmwares for, the, for, you, for these DIY keyboards tend to default to USB HID. Um, but there is some PS2 support. But some, some of the pieces of software are really sophisticated and they're effectively converting, excuse me, all the keyboard stuff into serial ASCII and Unicode transmissions and stuff. So it's all a bit confusing really. Um, there's a lot of different options. So we're gonna need to be careful what we choose. The other thing I know we can do is use a very low cost US, uh, you know, further down the road, rather than using any of these standard keyboards, we can adapt one of these or several of these keyboards quite easily. We could actually drag out the uh, microcontroller part of that and put a small FPGA on there and have it just literally do matrix scanning and, you know, bring the, uh, the key presses up over I squared C, SPI, U up, whatever you like quite frankly, um, because it's an FPGA, we can have it do anything. And we can use a very low cost FPGA to do that. Um, so if we want it pure FPGA, we could do that. The other alternative is we just use a um, uh, one of the microcontrollers on the keyboard and run you know, a version of the firmware that supports either USB if we want to do the USB implementation host which I'll come back to, or um, have it just do PS2 or I squared C, because some of that's already built in in some ways, particularly when you look at these split keyboards, because the two have to have a way of communicating the um, keystrokes. So we can either treat it like two low level keystroke providers and ignore the higher level parts of the software, in which case I think it uses UARTs and I squared C, or we can go up to something that's a bit more uh, involved that can do HID reporting or PS2 uh, reports, basically. We can even have it do kind of UART and serial report type business if we need to. Um, in fact, I seem to remember, didn't Apple do that with their um, 
wasn't it? Was it the APB or AKD? APB peripherals, I think it was. I forget now. So, um, yes, yeah, so my thoughts here is rather than maybe doing a VGA tile by default, which I'm still open to that idea, what about doing a HDMI uh, default tile? Now, the reason for doing the HDMI is we only need uh, four pairs to do the HDMI. Um, four FPGA pairs, so eight, eight IOs. So we've still got another four IOs left. Those could be used to either go directly to the USB-C if we want a four-way, um, or two to the USB-C plus I squared C, which we also have on the tile. And two could also go to the audio if we want to. Now on the audio front, it's a bit more complicated because there is some audio functionality already built into the STM32, which is mapped into the memory address space. And we might prefer to use that, and I'll come back to that in a minute. That's primarily digital audio, though, at this point in time. But it has some very good peripheral support for digital audio. Um, the setup in the STM32 is capable of handling I2C, SP diff, um, and you know M-clocked masters and dual-channel masters. Uh, and I'm putting aside those pins so it can do that in one peripheral, depending on how we wire that. And I've got to think how we expose that. Um, and if push comes to shove, it can bit bang out um, D class. But it can do PCM as well, so. Uh, it's a fairly flexible peripheral. So. I'm thinking maybe this tile here should cover all of our basis on the, um, if you like, the computer connectivity, display, keyboard interface, and possibly audio on a single tile. So the way that that would work on the top now is you'd have your um, display part of it, an I.O. part of it for your computer, if you like, on this tile. You could also, maybe optionally, offer the seven segment. That's not a necessity, but it's a good educational tile. Um, and then on the bottom, there's other things we can do. And I've been playing around with this. If we need to do the mix mod, or quadruple, or double, double P mod, either one of those, then this bottom tile has to be a double tile because we need 16 IOs, which is more than a single tile can provide. So it has to be two tiles. With the top, with the pins that are left over, you've got another eight here because you've actually got 24 IOs. So you could have this double tile. But the other possibility here is those pins could double up with the audio connector, say, for example, or a PS2 connector. It was just an idea I was playing around with. Um, you could also have pins for, you, under here you've got another SD card, um, so that you have a direct connect SD card. So that's kind of the way it's looking at the moment. The question is, first of all, what do we think of the top one? Is it better to go HDMI with USB C and potentially audio, or rather than the VGA tile by default? We could still offer a VGA tile, but all you get with a VGA tile is VGA because it requires more pins and there's no room in the aperture for anything larger than the VGA itself. Um, So that's one of the choices and at the moment I am currently personally favoring the HDMI route. Why do I prefer the HDMI route? Well I like being able to fit the other things on there like the USB-C and um, I'm just thinking that HDMI 
might be a better choice. It's a regular HDMI connector that I've got on there at the moment, I think, if I remember rightly. It's not the mini one, it's a regular one, Lorry. Lorry's asking which connector it is. Yes, uh, I don't have one handy. But yeah, they're smaller than the VGA connectors, which is about half the size of the aperture, basically. But bigger than what we had on, um, you know, the um, Black Ice, which is a mini HDMI. So I prefer to use HDMI rather than mini. Uh, if nothing else, those little mini connectors were a complete pain in the ass um, to reflow. If there was any sort of problem, you couldn't rework them. You just end up making them worse. They're, they're, the way that the back, the pins are very close for a start, but also they're molded in a very quite low temp plastic. And you get anywhere near it with a soldering iron and pff, the whole thing just, you know, um, just destructs really. So Laurie's saying I prefer HDMI, but VGA needs less logic, which may be significant on ice 40 for some retro ports. Yeah, quite possibly. Uh, I don't know how much that adds up to. The other advantage of VGA is it's better from a learning perspective because it's less complex. I don't know how much it uses in terms of LUTs versus VGA. Why? Well, we're driving it indirectly. So we're driving it, we have an interface in between us and it, but that is really just to change. Uh, we're basically using, the intention is to use four pairs, four pairs, uh, preferably have the, um, Uh, use the um, differential outputs, the LVDS outputs of the ICE 40, if we can. That then goes into a driver chip that I've got, that then converts it into TMDS drained, current drive driven, but um, also protects it. Um, from 5 volts and stuff. I can't remember what the... Uh, does the ULX3 version use the differential outputs of the ULX3? Using the pins as differential is optional on the ULX 3S. Yeah, I, I was just thinking it'd be better to use the differential pins. They're certainly available to us. Because the way that the um, pins are mapped for the tiles is the first eight digital pins are um, designed as pairs. I mean, you don't save that much on the ICE 40, to be quite honest. You don't have the same flexibility that you do have on the ULX3, but there is, you know, some saving. 
uh, and some speed benefit that can be had. But that's really just an optimization. We don't have to do that. We could drive them differentially using the internal logic if we want without having to use the specific I.O. functions. I can't remember what the drivers that we had before were, whether those were taking advantage of the diff differential I.O. outputs or whether those were just um, kind of virtual differential done in logic. ULX 3S must use differential capable pins, but they are configurable both ways. What do you mean both ways? You mean in and out, or do you mean you can swap the polarity of the positive and negative parts of the lines? Do you mean bidirectional, or do you mean you can change the A, B, differential or not? Yeah, well, you, the ice pins are differential or not. But even the differential in the ice is somewhat faked. But there is sometimes an advantage to be had by using that facility in the ice 40. Um, and we can wire it as such, and then you can use it by choice. However, I don't know what the overhead is of doing this LUT wise, Nori, compared to say a VGA. How much difference are we talking about? For a given bit depth and resolution, what is the difference between the two? I I, I don't know. Um, you know uh, exactly uh, what the difference would be in terms of overhead. So it we'll have to look at. But I'm kind of tempted to go the HDMI route, assuming that it works. I mean, we'll have to test this thoroughly. Now, I can't for the life of me remember. It's a long, long time since I've looked at the implementation. So I can't even remember exactly how it's... Um, how it's configured. Does it use a chunk of memory? You know, built in memory blocks or something? Does it need something like that or does it need a lot of registers to um, to act as a kind of um, data interface to get it in a, you know, TMDS format, frame format? But you generate a VGA signal and then convert it to HDMI, so it's always extra logic. Okay. I see what you're saying. The extra logic in this case is the serialization, rather than just a parallel output of you know, 8-bit or whatever it may be, with the VGA solution. So you're saying it has that VGA part, then it has this additional serialization part on top. I can see where you're coming from. Um, there may be some optimization there, possibly, by not doing it exactly like that, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I want to look at that right now. Um, it's probably not going to be that obvious. Would be my guess. Um, get rid of that. Uh, Just see if I can open that and look at it in the um let's have a look. Ten V eight B TMDS encoding of RGB and sync. I should bring this up.
So we've got three 8-bit registers in, or wires in. You need to, you're probably going to need more PLLs, that's for sure, because you need to do something quite clever with the clock, looking at this. So, shift eyes, shift, LD, TMDS red, shift L, 9292, What's this C? Is that the um, sink clock? Reg, no, no, shift on. So you've got you've got ten bit registers for these. Oh, pseudo differential driver. You might save yourself a bit of resource using the um, differential outputs, but not much. TMDS encoder is also faster. TDD ions. Input 7V video data red, green, and blue. Control data. Yeah, there's quite a bit in terms of conversion going on. Um. Yeah, this is kind of like three lets worth on each of those bits. I mean, it's not huge. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, I think we're going to have to try it as the answer. But assuming we don't get a technical problem, I mean, we have seen... Um, the HDMI done on ice 40s before, haven't we? Below res, you know, 64480 or something. So, what you're saying here, so if you run the VGA at 25 megs, you need to run the HDMI conversion at 125. Internal speed isn't a problem. It's certainly capable of doing 125 if it's structured right. Um, we'd have to look at the delays and the timing analysis, but um, it's probably doable. But we'd need to do it in order to um, see whether that was the case. That's kind of that would need to be a priority then, I guess. Um, I can't remember what the examples were for the HDMI stuff on ICE 40. It's a while back. I can't remember what what they were using, what they were displaying, whether they were using it on the back of a retro type application or if it was um, something else more bespoke.
Daniel O'Shea wrote code for his HDMI pre-mod. Name's not ringing a bell, Laurie. Um, hmm. Yeah, the only way you would have got it working properly on the black ice is via some sort of P-mod. So we need to check that out as a priority. Um, I don't know the best way of doing that. Um, to a degree we can find out by making the p-mod up uh, sorry by making the tile and if it doesn't fucking work excuse my french it doesn't near work and we'll have to drop back to vga whatever happens um, because it's on the tile and not on the main board we have that flexibility it's not like you know the issues that we had on black ice in that sense it's just a tile problem. It's whether the tile can do it or not. I mean, we don't really lose anything. Um, the assumption will be that we can do it until we prove otherwise, I think. But we will definitely just need to try it out. I mean, in terms of... See, here's what I'm thinking production-wise is... What I want to do is build five to start with, one of which I will need. Um, the others will go, you know, to any, anyone else that wants to buy in early, which I presume will be you guys. Um, then if we change that, um, I will replace that with the new versions so you don't need to worry if you know those changes if it changes later because I will replace what you're taking anyhow so um, but I was only going to do five on the next run I think um, so I don't know who's going to take those I'm guessing you'll take one Laurie um, obviously I'll take one. I've got uh, someone else who I'll have to introduce you guys to, um, who's going to be our guinea pig, uh, a friend of mine called uh, Michel. Um, he's a really smart guy, but he's not done FPGAs, so he's going to be Mr. Guinea Pig for us, which is kind of cool. And I promised him a unit. Uh, I think I post, I don't know if I post is logged in yet. I don't think he's logged in at the moment. I post might take one as well. Um, Laurie's just linked to an example that he did for the black eyes that we never got to test. I mean, we will be able to test it. Um, anyone on that initial um, five units becomes an official tester. Um, if you become an official tester, that means you're basically going to get all the tiles. It, as soon as they become available, you, you will be shipped one because I will expect you to um, be able to test them because <laughs> I need people testing them before I uh, actually go and uh, make them in any kind of volume. So you will automatically get um, pretty much one of every tile, certainly over the next month or so, a few months. Um, I was trying to think who else was on that list. 
it was TNT as well, but I might send TNT um, this one simply because it's got the hyperram on there to get him working on that earlier and then I'll send him one of these ones later because I'm not going to prioritize doing the hyper ram slash hyper flash mezzanine first I want to do the PS ram flash mezzanine first so that won't be in the next batch of uh, PCBs I order there won't be a hyper flash one um, I believe the Esden HDMI P mod drives HDMI. It does. He uses a conversion chip, so it's like a. He uses it's a parallel chip. Uh, I can't remember how many bits it is, but it's it can it does a conversion from parallel to HDMI. It may have sync as well. I'm not I'm not sure how it does the timing. It may be video specific, so it may be like parallel plus sync or something but I'm pretty sure it's parallel so it doesn't so that you don't have to do the serialization um, but I haven't used it so I don't I don't know much about it quite frankly and it comes in different um, bit depth versions So presumably it just duplicates the, the lower order bits on the lower bit versions of the chips. Uh, Western may want to be one of those first five as well, possibly. I don't know. I don't know what his time scales are, whether he wants to get involved in that. Um, I certainly don't, we're not going to have a problem having five different people on that first our problem is probably going to be the other way around there's going to be people that want it that I won't you know that won't get it on the first round because I need to I need a small number of people to start off with it not a large number of people because it's going to be quite intense I think getting everything sorted um, but it won't take long before you know the next order which will be you know uh, a much larger quantity so um, okay so let's leave the HDMI thing for a second let's just go back to um, the keycard thing so the question is what do we ship on the black ice front uh, ideally it will be HDMI but it, you know, if not, it will have to be a VGA if if we can't do the HDMI. And then what we'll have to do is maybe add the USB-C on the side, you know, uh, like, um, <sighs> rotate, there we go. I don't remember all my keycap keys. It's been a while. So maybe that can go there underneath somewhere, perhaps. Ah, Daniel O'Shea was called UXE on the MyStorm forms. Yeah, that rings more of a bell. Let's have a look. If we go back to the browser, hold on. I wonder if I can open. Am I not logged in?
Yeah, um, our solution will look very similar. Um, again, using the PTN3366. He's level shifting down. Three point three down to one point two. Yeah, I'm not sure if we need to do that. I I will need to just double check that. Now, what does he say here? My monitor recognizes the signal six forty four eighty sixty hertz. There's trouble keeping in sync, and I'm getting some weird interference, glitchy vertical lines. My feeling is this may be due to high frequency reflections and requires better hardware design. My hope is that someone will spot something in the code that may help. I don't know if he tried it in different PMOD slots as well, because that could have a an impact. Um, you've got a guess just there. Um, this is based on Mike Field's work. See links below. He uses the ICE 40 DDR output mode to get 250 megahertz outputs from 125 megahertz clock. A couple of these PML boards to spare. Uh, this is interesting. So, I jaking says, been meaning to have a go with this myself. Nice job on the hardware. I had a go with the code, but not sure what P mod you are using. So, I picked one. Timing estimate is indeed not great at 60 megahertz, which is probably cause the issue. Next PNL, don't forget we were using the uh, ice storm stuff at this point. Um, uh, next PNL does a much better job with a quick seed sweep. I got much closer to 122 megahertz, which is in the right sort of region. It may depend which ports you choose as well. Um, thanks for the uh, next PNL. I'm going to try and compile it, but honestly, it's like pulling teeth. Run into some separate roadblocks. Oh, these could have been early NX, uh, next PNR issues. Uh, so many poor teeth later we have next PNR working. Turns out the interface was actually due to cable though. Interference was cable based. That's interesting. I've been using a 1.5 meter HDMI to DVI cable. Trying hard to optimize the code any way I could. Eventually I kidnapped the monitor from the family computer which has HDMI input, switch to using a 0.5 meter HDMI, HDMI cable and no more interference. Interesting. Sync was still a little glitchy, but a couple of minor adjustments uh, to the original unoptimized code fixed it. The code is still a little fragile, but a picture is worth a thousand tiny cuts. Interesting. Yeah, I've forgotten all about this, Fred.
Just reading some small print here. I know on, on the ULX free stuff they're not using the um, BTN 3366. Are they, Laurie? Um, or are they? Oh, we see moss one two though so you can skip the yeah Oh, so you got one of these boards, Laurie. You actually tried one of these boards. So clearly your uh, results were um, more variable. Yeah, you seem to have um, a very variable experience with his code. I'm looking back for the history of this now. K 
occasionally loses the picture for a moment. Oh, could that be the main reason for the uh, screens not syncing then? So there's a couple of things that could be issues. I mean, it certainly looks possible. One is the base frequency of the VGA, the 25 point whatever. Um, which we might be able to improve on. The other is which pins you're using and how well those are wired. Again, that's going to be a much better arrangement on here than it was on the black ice. I'm crossing my fingers when I'm saying that. It should be, in theory. Um, Yeah, I think we're just going to have to buy it and try it, as they say. See how far we get. See if our results differ at all. But uh, yeah, following through that thread might be a good place to start. Um, and I don't know how different that stuff is compared to the ULX3 code. It's, the other interesting thing here is that they're saying that in order to drive that, he's doing a voltage conversion first. Hmm. Before he's driving the uh, PSTN chip, which has me wondering about a couple of things. Well, that's actually the best way of doing it. I think we're going to have to experiment with this. Uh, Laurie says, one, um, one issue with the BBC micro port over HDMI is it uses a 32 megahertz clock and corresponding VGA clock, which needs 160 megahertz clock, and I don't think that works. Well, yeah, I can see why that might be an issue. Uh, it uses 32 megahertz. Hmm. Hoglet has a solution for that, but not in his ICE 40 port. Yeah, I'd need to understand better how that works. Um, and whether there is a way of solving that issue. Could be a problem. Um, it would be nice to do things on HDMI if possible, but it could also open a new um, can of worms in a number of cases. Uh, I think there's only one way we're going to find out, and that's by trying it, frankly. <sighs> I mean, we still have the VGA option anyhow. 
I mean, for a proper, if you were building a proper retro solution, not a new soft core, you'd probably want the VGA tile and the HDMI tile. Um, you know, you'd probably want to go all out. And those would probably be more important to you than the seven segment, right? And there's nothing stopping you having both of those tiles, you know, the VGA and HDMI and being able to use either as you see fit. But we could use a digital P mod for those cases. What do you mean the digital P lot P mod? Are you talking about VGA? Because we will have a VGA tile as well. It's just what we ship standard with black ice is what I'm thinking at the moment. There is a VGA tile. I'm not going to not do a VGA tile. It's just what we ship with black ice by default. It's kind of what I'm thinking about here. Interesting. Oh, excuse me. Crikey, keeping myself up. I'm out of tea. Onto the regular hydration. Is VGA what you meant by the digital P mod? Laurie. Yeah, I mean there will be a VGA tile as well, so that will be an option. So we've always got that to fall back on. It's just what I was trying to work out is what we shipped, you know, as standard in this kind of black ice uh, configuration. If you're buying an ILB, you are choosing which P mods you want. Um, even with black ice, I can offer extra P mods as an option just in the same way we do sorry not p mods extra tiles as an option just in the same way we offer extra p mods um they don't all have to fit on the board at once you know you can fit them as you require them it's what the default configuration is oh excuse me crikey i'm gonna need some sugar soon i don't know if i've got any today i've got a bit down here the, uh, let me bring up the key card again. And let me turn off the, um, let's test. The Mr. Project uses HDMI by default, but has an IO board with a VGA connector. Yeah. Well, here it's just a different tile. You just add it in if you need it. questions on the configuration because otherwise I will still we're still wondering about what goes on here at the bottom by default
Oh, by the way, just as a reminder for the, those of you that don't know, the, currently the um, Black Ice MX is based on the combination of an ice core and this carrier, which is the Black Ice MX carrier. If I can get it to focus there. Now, although originally when we had the um, Black Eye stuff made, it came with the um, P mods already soldered. For the last God knows how long, I've had to manually make these. Now, these involve soldering three mix mugs one, two, three. Each one of those is 30 pins, and then this 26 pin dual row connector on the bottom. Now, if you add that up, that's 90 plus 26, it's 116 soldered joints, soldered by yours truly, and then cleaned afterwards in the ultrasonic bath, etc., etc., etc. So, for all of the consumership ones, i.e., the ones that are sold through, you know, Tindy and that, rather than any of the direct deals, the bulk deals, I had to manually solder all of these. And this weekend, I soldered the last batch ever. <laughs> so while it's uh, a historical end of moment, which is a bit sad, it's the remains of the uh, Black Ice MX stock, because I can't build anymore because I can't get the damn chips. Um, I am... <laughs> <laughs> so pleased that I don't have to solder 116 joints for every consumer I through Tindy Black Ice MX board I, I, uh, I, um, I sell because that has been a nightmare doing all that soldering so that was a bit of a rejoice last weekend or weekend just gone the fact that I won't have to do that again I, that can be unbelievably tedious I, I did try and add out I couldn't I can't remember exactly how many I've sold through you know the kind of consumer or tindy channels I mean it's hundreds not as many as I we've sold generally but you know hundreds so um, you're talking about tens of thousands of soldered joints that I've had to do over that period of time I can't, I can't, I'm not sure quite how long that stretches back but over a year um, of laborious soldering careful soldering uh, and I've gotten through quite a few uh, solder tips um, when you're using lead free solder uh, it's a lot more corrosive on the tips and I've gotten through a whole crap load of tips doing those and I'm kind of looking forward not to um, ever have to do those again which is another advantage of tiles by the way because the connector is a surface mount, so I can reflow them much easier. So much easier. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, yes, one of the other things I was going to say so, looking at the mezzanine, if we imagine the other mezzanine, um, not the retro mezzanine, or not the black ice mezzanine, whatever we decide to call it. With something like the uh, Hyper Flash and Hyper, Hyper RAM, we could also put, you know, um, something like um, an LCD display or a camera, is what I'm thinking. And we could use the FPC connector because it just fits. Can you see at the moment it's a bit too wide? Um, but I can adjust this footprint. This footprint isn't the uh, most optimum footprint. You can produce a smaller footprint than this. 
that just fits in the mezzanine. So that's kind of a nice advantage to having widened it as well, which is kind of cool. Um, it's nearly wide enough for a USB A female host, which is interesting. But I think that's actually pushing it just slightly because if you look at this here, uh, just to show you how close that is. Where am I got selected here? Why is it not? Um, there we go. So if you look at the height of that, it's actually just a bit too wide at the moment. Because of the way that this plugs in, it doesn't quite fit because the, um, these pins have to be uh, through hole and there's a cutout. And the dist different distance between the cutout and the edge of the mezzanine is so small that it would make the ends of the mezzanine really fragile. So it wouldn't be completely practical. But that was one of the things I was thinking of that would be kind of nice. But in reality, it's probably not going to work for that type of connector. But we could put a USB-C on there. That's not a problem. Because USB-C width is, you know, easy big enough to fit in the mezzanine. So now that mezzanine is slightly wider, we've got a few more choices of what we might add to it um, in the cases where we've got more IOs left, i.e. in an unretro storage memory, and we're using the hyperflash. So um, that's also quite cool. Uh, What else did I need to cover? So I've covered the mezzanine changes. I talked about HDMI versus VGA. I've had no real extra thoughts on what goes on, you know, below here. Um, in addition to the mix mod, other than maybe you could have something like a PS2 connector and an audio connector would squeeze in there. It would be alternate uses of the pins that are connected to the double P mod. Um, which is a may or may not. I'm just toying with that idea. Um, I was also thinking of adding in these connectors here, the auxiliary power connectors, which is kind of handy. And then we've got the power over USB connection here. There may be another USB connector as well. And that may go here. Um, and the purpose of that would be, so that would be kind of, this kind of thing ah. go here that would be like a, that could be used as a kind of host connection it goes through the SGM32 there is room to do that Oh, Griff says, do you have an FPGA connected SD card anywhere? Yeah, potentially down here, if you look underneath in blue, if I can select it, hold on. 
This one, that could be on the P mod tile, P mod, mix mod tile, possibly. That's still a possibility there. But obviously in these cases it's one or t'other, you can't use all of them at once. You'd have to decide which you made available. Does, what, what um, colour resolution does the bead require? How many bits for the VGA does it require? Sorry. The reason I'm asking is because you could combine the SD card and the VGA if it was a low number of bits. However, I think you're going to be pushing it. I think it's two bits per channel, so you'd need six bits, right, for the colours. And then you'd need two bits for the sink. Um, and that would leave you four for an SD card. However, even though that would work as a beep uh, display, it wouldn't be very good for other things who perhaps want more than six bits for their VGA. Normally eight bits is a bit better. Or you can go even higher as well, but. So I was just thinking the only thing that would really need VGA would be the beep. But that might not be a case. There might be um, other retros that um, would be better with VGA. And limiting it to two bits per colour might be um, a bit extreme. I was just thinking whether it can be combined with the SD card but it's probably you're probably pushing it because that really limits the VGA because you need four four pins for the SD card so that only leaves eight in total two of which have got to be sync so yeah you could do two bits but yeah it would only be suitable for the beep or anything that uses two bits per channel colour. I guess it depends how successful the um, uh, HDMI is. You know, if the HDMI works with everything else, and doesn't you know add too much in the way of um, LUTs then maybe it becomes specific to things like the BBC where you need to use the um, BGA, the analog. How are we doing for time anyhow? It's only quarter past nine, we're okay. Right, well I covered everything on here then that's changed. Any other questions about the ILB layout and or tile options, etc. I notice um, 
I'm getting quite a few drop frames, but it seems to recover. It goes through phases. I don't know why it's so bad at the moment. It's really strange. It was really good for a while, and then it's kind of gone downhill a tad. Let me just try something. See if that improves it. I'm really flashing in the red here, dropping a lot of frames. Maybe it's the um, internet interface. The ISP internet interface could be causing issues. I always use Digilent P mod, which has four bits per channel. Well, if you're going for a PMOD adapter, then you could add that in this way, I guess. The maximum you can get with a tile is um, 10 bits, because you need two lines for the sink. And with 10 bits, you're probably best doing a kind of four for green, four for red, and two for blue. Um, your mileage may vary really or you could do um, you could do four for green three for red three for blue which is pretty good result but you want to maximize the green more than the other colors because that's what the human eye is more sensitive to. So you want to maximise the bits on that that part of the colour space. Let's clean my glasses. <clears throat> that's where we are currently. Hoglet uses four bits per channel for the. Hmm. Well, I might even be able to see through my glasses again in a minute. How very wonderful. Uh, the issue is how accurately you can match the original palette, says Laurie. Yeah, so you're you're doing colour conversions effectively. But you're starting with a, a larger palette. And then you're moving, you know, or mapping, I guess, the colour space of the beeb within that. Are you doing it through a lookup table or something? Or are you just shifting the bits?
So B only uses eight colours, but two bit for channel would probably give the wrong colours. Yeah, so what does it do? Does it you does it does it just shift the digits or does it actually use a lookup? Is it just, just does it, it only uses eight colors so it's only only needs eight register lookups or eight looks to do the conversion I guess Yeah, so in other words, you'd want um, more colours rather than less, so that you could do the same thing. Interesting. Yeah, some retros have a palette lookup, yeah. That was the way I'd fi figured that you'd do, you know, the beep to get the colours as accurate as possible. You can cherry pick. If it's only a small number of colours, it's easy to do cherry pick for a palette lookup. Right. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to call it if there aren't any other questions. Because I've still got a whole bunch of stuff to do. I'm trying to get through this damn routing at the moment. It's killing me. It really is. It's a bit awkward. Um, and I just need to um, get as much done as possible this week on it. Because it's bugging me and I need it out of the way. Fundamentally. I still don't. can't think of a good name. Black Eyes, Black Eyes 101, you know, Black Eyes Retro, Black Eyes Bench, I don't know, doing my head in that. Every time I think about that, I don't get anywhere. So I'm more interested in just getting the um, Ice Logic board done first. Or Ice Logic Bench, or Ice Logic Plus. I've been calling it multiple things recently. Right, I'm going to call it a day. I will be on Discord if anyone needs to catch me. Um, if you have any more ideas or changes or anything, do let me know. I've always joined us down on Discord. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to stream this Friday. It depends. I might not stream this Friday because um, my youngest is back from uni for a start. And um, I really do need to get more of this routing done as a priority, so I might give the second uh, stream a break this weekend. Um, otherwise, it'll be next Wednesday. But anyhow, thanks for joining me, folks, and ciao. I will see you all very soon. <laughs>